Ocular by Inadequacy. Chapter 3. When he woke again, it was dark, aside from a few sad candles casting more shadows than light. Lawrence was asleep on a chair next to his cot. The man would likely stop him from getting up and vigorously insist that he stay here and rest. Given that he found it hard to disobey Lawrence's requests on a good day, nonetheless when he felt he may have been put in a whiskey barrel and tossed down a mountain, it was tantamount he maneuvered as stealthily as possible out of the sick tent as to not to wake his man. Though he did not usually consider himself a subtle character, he could adapt to the situation. The last thing he needed was a kind, thoughtful, and considerate voice urging him to take care of himself. There were too many important things to do. He tested his feet and pushed experimentally down on the ground. They seemed to work this time, which was a definite improvement. He still felt that he had been tossed from no less than four consecutive horses, but they were in a war and being tossed from a horse or two was an extremely survivable event. He managed to stand with some effort. He studied the dark corner of their tent and peered at the few shadows and the flickering silhouette of a fire somewhere outside. He flexed the balls of his feet as a test, and then he smiled. My most sincere apologies, dearest Lawrence, for I know you only want the best for me, and I simply cannot ignore my duties any longer. I will speak against any punishments on you for letting me escape, as you could not have imagined the fruited depths of my character. He whispered, and then he hurried as fast as his legs would take him. The first few steps were fraught with danger, and each one came with a healthy twinge of sore pain from his legs. But his feet became accustomed to walking, and he felt it might be safe to even not stare at the ground as he moved. The cold of the camp turned the blood in his veins to a dull sludge, but he put that to the side as he made his way to Washington's tent. Is he much farther away than he remembered? That the army's size had increased and required doubling the camp seemed ludicrous, but it had never taken what felt like a day's march to arrive there. He drew himself up as straight as his sore back would allow as he approached the tent. The guards knew him well, and one smiled as he approached. "'The general will be upset if he sees you out in this cold night and not resting, Lieutenant Colonel,' said Michaels, the one on the left and a fellow New Yorker. "'Though it seems unlikely that anyone including himself could convince you to take a rest.' Is he available to see me, sir? Alexander asked, suppressing a smile. Let him in, came the voice from inside the tent. The guards moved aside. It was a moderately well-lit tent, even in the dark night, and with good reason. Maps and papers were stacked everywhere and interspersed with several large pieces of furniture, as well as a fair number of chests in various stages of unpackedness. Several chairs sat around in the tent, including a few particularly comfortable-looking ones around a large center table, two of which were presently occupied. I presume you left Lawrence sleeping in the hospital next to you, said Lafayette, seated in the chair next to Washington, as I suspect he would have tied you down had he been woken. Major General, Alexander said, offering a friendly smile to Lafayette before returning his attention to Washington. Your Excellency... I apologize for being remiss in my duties. I will return immediately to your service. You'll do no such thing, Washington said, and he gestured to an empty seat. You fought off a fever tough enough to destroy an entire regiment, and you'll be sleeping as much as you can in the upcoming days before the battle, so your strength is restored for when we need you. Alexander sat in the offered chair. His legs twitched and ached, as if they only now realized the strain they were under. It might have been the most comfortable chair he had ever sat in. Excellency, I have already been away for... He realized he had no idea what day it was. He was saved by the tent flap opening. He did not need to turn to know it was Lawrence. In fact, he could perfectly picture Lawrence's peeved expression. A glance confirmed his hypothesis as completely accurate. General Hamilton is conscious. Lawrence announced in a vaguely resigned tone of voice. Lafayette chuckled. And Washington grinned. I would not have expected you to do the impossible, like stopping the strong man from working himself to death. Washington said, gesturing again, and Lawrence looked relieved as he sat. You have been sleeping for four days, Lafayette said after a pause. You passed out mid-March and were running a fever hot enough to eat this tent. We set up camp shortly after. The lieutenant colonel, he gestured to Lawrence, has been taking exquisite care of you. 
He has also informed us of your desperate attempt to single-handedly destroy the medical tent in revenge for sheltering you. Luckily, he was able to aid the tent in its darkest hour. Alexander remembered being held. Four days? Alexander stared at each one of them in turn. They all had the same army ragged expression that he was now thoroughly familiar with. Lawrence's dark eyes were etched with worry. Lafayette looked a little smug about his joke, though that failed to hide a deep anxiety about their situation. Washington, watching him with concern, mixed with some relief and the ever-present pressure of being the general of the army. Four days seemed like an eternity. The last thing he remembered was the march. They had been in a storm. It had to have been a snowstorm, although part of him recalled a hurricane with inarguable clarity. How were you feeling? Washington asked. It was a difficult question. He felt like he had been recently surprised attacked by a cannon that had grown arms and thoroughly beaten him all over with iron fists. That seemed like a bad answer. He was clearly not fine, which would have been ideal. I am a soldier, Excellency. Soldiers do not usually operate in excellent shape. It was a good answer. He must have been feeling better. Washington studied him for a long moment. I do have orders for you, after all. Alexander perked up. Go to that table over there. He gestured to a small end table and a little chair off to the side of the tent. I'd pick up that pen and paper and write to your wife explaining how you were dreadfully ill and you were on limited duty until you recover and you are going to spend some time refreshing your correspondence with your friends and family on your commander's orders. His shoulders drooped. I could at least transcribe your letters, sir? Depending on the quality of your letter to your wife, I may permit you to transcribe my letters. Add frustration replaced the ache in Alexander's bones. He frowned and sat up straighter. General, certainly there are things to be done around the camp, especially with the battle so near- Yes, and those things will be handled by members of my staff who have not nearly been struck dead. Washington looked at Lawrence, who saluted. As for you, Major General, you are dismissed, but if I could heap another task upon your burdened shoulders- Of course, sir. Lafayette snapped to attention. I am putting you in charge of Hamilton, starting tomorrow morning. Be sure he is not sneaking around doing work he was not ordered to do. Maybe give him some small task to do so he does not drive you completely from your wits with his chatter. Alexander only partially squashed a noise of protest. I came to your beautiful country to do the impossible, General. It is my great honor to look after your man. The smile Alexander heard in Lafayette's voice made him clench his teeth in frustration as the Frenchman left the tent. He did not need a babysitter, and certainly not one of Lafayette's rank or importance. He was more than capable of doing his work and making sure he didn't die. That Washington didn't believe that and that Lafayette thought it was a joke made him almost dizzy with anger. General, he started. I believe I have made yourself exceptionally clear, especially for a man of great intellect like yourself. Dismissive. Alexander clenched his fists in his gloves. Lieutenant Colonel, find this man something to eat and some whiskey, and then you are dismissed for the evening. Lawrence nodded, saluted, and left. Washington returned to studying the map in front of him and scribbling down in his journal. Alexander stared at the ground, then rebelliously at the side table where he had been assigned. His feet wanted to move that way, but something stopped them. Your Excellency, you cannot expect me to sit here and write of nothing of importance when we are so close to battle. You know as well as I do that there was no better- Alexander. The edge in the general's voice stopped him in mid-sentence. He sat back in the chair and found it suddenly hard to keep eye contact with the other man. You have no idea how ill you have been. You have no idea how much we worried about you as you shivered and kicked off your blankets and froze and shuddered. You were close enough to death that we nearly considered letting your wife know you had passed. There was an undeniable sharpness there that held Alexander's attention like seeing a bear in the forest. He realized all of a sudden that this was not just his commanding officer, but his friend talking as well. If you continue to run around in this cold, barely recovered, 
you will die. This cause needs you. I need you. The Marquise needs you. Your wife needs you. Lawrence needs you. I know you know that, despite your desperate and repeated attempts to throw your life away for the sake of your blasted legacy. I will be damned if I permit your stubborn foolishness to be your death. So you will sit in that chair, and you will write to your wife, disgusting, how you are on reduced duty because you are recovering from a terrible fever, and if I hear another complaint or, but sir, until that letter is complete, I will see that you are punished for being insubordinate. The threat, a very real threat based on the fury in the general's eyes, hung between them. Washington waited. Yes, Your Excellency, Alexander said. Good, Washington said, and then he went back to his map without another word. Alexander slunk over to the side table. He stared at the paper. It was hard to look at the empty surface. The pen wavered in and out of focus. He thought of Eliza, beautiful, waiting at home for him. He thought of Angelica. He thought words, and his hand moved without him having to think about it. He was writing about some particular thing Lawrence had said a few days ago when his train of thought was distracted by the sound of a throat clearing. His head snapped up to see the very man he was writing about standing in front of him with his hands filled. Seeing Lawrence holding a food and flask was even better than just seeing Lawrence with his hands empty. Leave the rations with Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton, and you are dismissed for the night, Washington said without looking up. Alexander smiled and stood with some difficulty. There was no face that could make him feel better. Just the thought of knowing it had been Lawrence looking out for him when he had been ill. It made something suspicious and warm bloom in his chest like a wildflower. He had some trouble identifying it exactly, but it was familiar and it reminded him of Eliza. He closed his eyes and tried to recall four missing days. There had been a storm. There was ice. There was a hurricane. Or maybe there had been nothing. It was hard to say. He remembered the eye. There had been calm. He had been held and lulled him to sleep. He had been wrapped in a gentle embrace. That was the only certainty of the missing time. I have some rations for you, Hamilton. Lawrence said, and he dropped the bag next to Alexander's chair. Add some whiskey. He offered a flask. Alexander took a swig and felt the sharp burn of it in his throat. He glanced over to the general, who appeared deeply invested in the correspondence he was reading. By now, Alexander knew the general quite well and had no doubt the man had half an ear cocked in their direction. Part of him knew that Lawrence should be on his way for all of their sakes. He needed to write his letter, the general would want to read in silence, and Lawrence would have other work to do. There was a seemingly long second of silence, disturbed only by Washington's ruffling of papers. He could not help it. He spoke. Dear Lawrence, I did not mean to embarrass you. I should have known you would have intended to evade me. That I fell asleep is a mark against my character, especially given the challenge of making you do something other than work. I would never see to make a mark against your character, he frowned. I would never see to make a strike of any kind against you. Certainly, you are aware. But there are things to be done, and they must be done. I will not make notice of you. Pray do not pay attention to it, my friend, he said, smiling a little. Alexander felt helpless to do anything but smile back. No one would hold me responsible for being unable to stop you from doing something you wanted to do. I did not wish to indicate to others that you were inattentive. Lawrence patted his shoulder. His hand was warm to the ragged coat. I am certain others saw my task as impossible, and will not look down upon me for failing as a mortal might. I would have made you seem godlike had I known. His voice was gentle. Lawrence shook his head and stepped back. Write your letter, Alexander, he said, and he pressed his hand against the man's forehead like he was a babe. The hand was cold, but somehow he felt better anyway. His pain settled. The exhaustion lifted, if only for a moment. Then he pulled away and left the tent, leaving Alexander's chest aching in a way that seemed nothing like a horse had kicked him. He ended the paragraph and segued quickly into the part of his sickness where it had seemed like an angel of calm had come over him. He was not sure he would have awoken at all if not for the eye.